chapters 19 and 20 of Book 1 of Generation of Animals by Aristotle, translated by Arthur Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 19. After this we must distinguish of what sort of nutriment it is a secretion, and must discuss the catamenia which occur in certain of the vivipara. For thus we shall make it clear, one, whether the female also produces semen, like the male, and the fetus is a single mixture of two semens, or whether no semen is secreted by the female, and two, if not, whether she contributes nothing else, either to generation, but only provides a receptacle, or whether she does contribute something, and if so, how and in what manner she does so. We have previously stated that the final nutriment is the blood in the sanguinea, and the analogous fluid in the other animals. Since the semen is also a secretion of the nutriment, and that in its final stage it follows that it will be either one blood, or that which is analogous to blood, or two, something formed from this. But since it is from the blood, when concocted and somehow divided up, that each part of the body is made, and since the semen, if properly concocted, is quite of a different character from the blood when it is separated from it, but if not properly concocted, has been known in some cases to issue in a bloody condition, if one forces oneself too often to coition. Therefore, it is plain that semen will be a secretion of the nutriment, when reduced to blood, being that which is finally distributed to the parts of the body. And this is the reason why it has so great power. For the loss of the pure and healthy blood is an exhausting thing. For this reason also it is natural that the offspring should resemble the parents, for that which goes to all the parts of the body resembles that which is left over, so that the semen which is to form the hand, or the face, or the whole animal, is already the hand, or face, or whole animal undifferentiated, and what each of them is actually, such is the semen potentially, either in virtue of its own mass, or because it has a certain power in itself. I mention these alternatives here, because we have not yet made it clear, from the distinctions drawn hitherto, whether it is the matter of the semen that is the cause of generation, or whether it has in it some faculty and efficient cause thereof. For the hand also, or any other bodily part, is not hand or other part in a true sense, if it be without soul or some other power, but is only called by the same name as the living hand. On this subject, then, so much may be laid down. But, since it is necessary, one, that the weaker animal also should have a secretion greater in quantity and less concocted, and, two, that being of such a nature it should be a mass of sanguineous liquid, and three, since that which nature endows with a smaller portion of heat is weaker, and four, since it has already been stated that such is the character of the female. Putting all these considerations together we see that the sanguineous matter discharged by the female is also a secretion, and such is the discharge of the so-called catamenia. It is plain, then, that the catamenia are a secretion, and that they are analogous in females to the semen in males. The circumstances connected with them are evidence that this view is correct, for the semen begins to appear in males, and to be emitted at the same time of life, that the catamenia begin to flow in females, and that they change their voice and their breasts begin to develop. So, too, in the decline of life, the generative power fails in the one sex, and the catamenia in the other. The following signs also indicate that this discharge in females is a secretion. Generally speaking, women suffer neither from hemorrhoids, 
nor bleeding at the nose, nor anything else of the sort, except when the catamenia are ceasing. And if anything of the kind occurs, the flow is interfered with because the discharge is diverted to it. Further, the blood vessels of women stand out less than those of men, and women are rounder and smoother because the secretion which in men goes to these vessels is drained away with the catamenia. We must suppose, too, that the same cause accounts for the fact that the bulk of the body is smaller in females than in males among the vivipara, since this is the only class in which the catamenia are discharged from the body and in this class the fact is clearest in women, for the discharge is greater in women than in the other animals, wherefore her pallor and the absence of prominent blood vessels is most conspicuous, and the deficient development of her body compared with a man's is obvious. Now, since this is what corresponds in the female to the semen in the male, and since it is not possible that two such discharges should be found together, it is plain that the female does not contribute semen to the generation of the offspring. For if she had semen, she would not have the catamenia. But as it is, because she has the latter, she has not the former. It has been stated, then, that the catamenia are a secretion as the semen is, and confirmation of this view may be drawn from some of the phenomena of animals. For fat creatures produce less semen than lean ones, as observed before. The reason is that fat also, like semen, is a secretion, is in fact concocted blood, only not concocted in the same way as the semen. Thus, if the secretion is consumed to form fat, the semen is naturally deficient. And so, among the bloodless animals, the cephalopoda and crustacea are in best condition about the time of producing gangs, for, because they are bloodless and no fat is formed in them, that which is analogous in them to fat is at that season drawn off to form the spermatic secretion. And a proof that the female does not emit similar semen to the male and that the offspring is not formed by a mixture of both, as some say, is that often the female conceives without the sensation of pleasure in intercourse, and if again the pleasure is experienced by her, no less than by the male, and the two sexes reach their goal together, yet often no conception takes place unless the liquid of the so-called catamenia is present in a right proportion. Hence the female does not produce young if the catamenia are absent altogether, nor often when, they being present, the efflux still continues, but she does so after the purgation. For in the one case she has not the nutriment or material from which the fetus can be framed by the power coming from the male and inherent in the semen and in the other it is washed away with the catamenia because of their abundance. But when, after their occurrence, the greater part has been evacuated, the remainder is formed into a fetus. Cases of conception, when the catamenia do not occur at all, or of conception during their discharge instead of after it, are due to the fact that in the former instance there is only so much liquid to begin with, as remains behind after the discharge in fertile women, and no greater quantity is secreted so as to come away from the body, while in the latter instance the mouth of the uterus closes after the discharge. When, therefore, the quantity already expelled from the body is great, but the discharge still continues, only not on such a scale as to wash away the semen, then it is that conception accompanies coition. Nor is it at all strange that the catamenia should still continue after conception, for even after it they recur to some extent, but are scanty and do not last during all the period of gestation. This, however, is a morbid phenomenon, wherefore it is found only in a few cases, and then seldom 
whereas it is that which happens as a regular thing that is according to nature. It is clear, then, that the female contributes the material for generation, and that this is in the substance of the catamenia, and that they are a secretion. 20. Some think that the female contributes semen in coition, because the pleasure she experiences is sometimes similar to that of the male, and also is attended by a liquid discharge. But this discharge is not seminal. It is merely proper to the part concerned in each case. For there is a discharge from the uterus, which occurs in some women but not in others. It is found in those who are fair-skinned and of a feminine type generally, but not in those who are dark and of a masculine appearance. The amount of this discharge, when it occurs, is sometimes on a different scale from the emission of semen and far exceeds it. Moreover, different kinds of food cause a great difference in the quantity of such discharges. For instance, some pungently flavored foods cause them to be conspicuously increased. And, as to the pleasure which accompanies quition, it is due to emission not only of semen but also of a spiritus, the coming together of which precedes the emission. This is plain in the case of boys, who are not yet able to emit semen, but are near the proper age, and of men who are impotent, for all these are capable of pleasure by attrition. And those who have been injured in the generative organs sometimes suffer from diarrhea because the secretion, which they are not able to concoct and turn into semen, is diverted into the intestine. Now a boy is like a woman in form, and the woman is, as it were, an impotent male. For it is through a certain incapacity that the female is female, being incapable of concocting the nutriment in its last stage into semen. And this is either blood, or that which is analogous to it in animals which are bloodless, owing to the coldness of their nature. As then diarrhea is caused in the bowels by the insufficient concoction of the blood, so are caused in the blood vessels all discharges of blood, including that of the catamenia. For this also is such a discharge, only it is natural, whereas the others are morbid. Thus it is clear that it is reasonable to suppose that generation comes from this. For the catamenia are semen, not in a pure state, but in need of working up, just as in the formation of fruits the nutriment is present when it is not yet sifted thoroughly, but needs working up to purify it. Thus the catamenia cause generation by mixture with the semen, as this impure nutriment in plants is nutritious when mixed with pure nutriment. And a sign that the female does not emit semen is the fact that the pleasure of intercourse is caused by touch in the same region of the female as of the male, and yet is it not from thence that this flow proceeds. Further, it is not all females that have it at all, but only the sanguinea, and not all even of these, but only those whose uterus is not near the hyposoma, and which do not lay eggs. It is not found in the animals which have no blood, but only the analogous fluid. For what is blood in the former is represented by another fluid in the latter. The reason why neither the latter nor those sanguinea mentioned, it is those whose uterus is low and which do not lay eggs, have this effluxion is the dryness of their bodies. This allows but little matter to be secreted, only enough for generation but not enough to be discharged from the body. All animals that are viviparous without producing eggs first, such are man and all quadrupeds, which bend their hind legs outwards, for all these are viviparous without producing eggs. All these have the catamenia, unless they are defective in development, as the mule. Only the efflux is not abundant as in women. Details of the facts in each animal have been given in the inquiries concerning animals. The catamenia are more abundant in women than in the other animals, 
and men emit the most semen in proportion to their size. The reason is that the composition of their bodies is liquid and hot compared to others, for more matter must be secreted in such a case. Further, man has no such parts in his body as those to which the superfluous matter is diverted in the other animals, for he has no great quantity of hair in proportion to his body, nor outgrowths of bones, horns, and teeth. There is evidence that the semen is in the catamenia, for, as said before, this secretion appears in the male at the same time of life as the catamenia in the female. This indicates that the parts destined to receive each of these secretions are differentiated at the same time in both sexes. And as the neighboring parts in both become swollen, the hair of puberty springs forth in both alike. As the parts in question are on the point of differentiating, they are distended by the spiritus. This is clearer in males in the testes, but appears also about the breasts. In females it is more marked in the breasts, for it is when they have risen two fingers' breadth that the catamenia generally begin. Now, in all living things in which the male and female are not separated, the semen or seed is a sort of embryo. By embryo I mean the first mixture of male and female. Hence from one semen comes one body, for example one stalk of wheat from one grain, as one animal from one egg, for twin eggs are really two eggs. But in whatever kinds the sexes are distinguished, in these many animals may come from one emission of semen, showing that the semen differs in its nature in plants and animals. A proof of this is that animals which can bear more than one young one at a time do so in consequence of only one coition, whereby too it is plain that the semen does not come from the whole of the body, for neither would the different parts of the semen already be separated as soon as discharged from the same part nor could they be separated in the uterus if they had once entered it altogether. But what does happen is just what one would expect, since what the male contributes to generation is the form and the efficient cause, while the female contributes the material. In fact, as in the coagulation of milk, the milk being the material, the fig juice or rennet is that which contains the curdling principle, so acts the secretion of the male being divided into parts in the female. Why it is sometimes divided into more or fewer parts, and sometimes not divided at all, will be the subject of another discussion. But because it does not differ in kind at any rate, this does not matter. But what does matter is only that each part should correspond to the material, being neither too little to concoct it and fix it into form, nor too much so as to dry it up. It then generates a number of offspring, but from this first formative semen, if it remains one and is not divided, only one young one comes into being. That then the female does not contribute semen to generation, but does contribute something, and that this is the matter of the catamenia, or that which is analogous to it in bloodless animals, is clear from what has been said and also from a general and abstract survey of the question. For there must needs be that which generates, and that from which it generates, even if these be one, still they must be distinct in form and their essence must be different. And in those animals that have these powers separate in two sexes, the body and nature of the active and the passive sex must also differ. If then the male stands for the effective and active, and the female considered as female for the passive, it follows that what the female would contribute to the semen of the male would not be semen but material for the semen to work upon. This is just what we find to be the case, for the catamenia have in their nature an affinity to the primitive matter. End of chapter 20 Chapters 21 to 23 of Book 1 of Generation of Animals by Aristotle.
Translated by Arthur Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 21. So much for the discussion of this question. At the same time, the answer to the next question we have to investigate is clear from these considerations. I mean, how it is that the male contributes to generation, and how it is that the semen from the male is the cause of the offspring. Does it exist in the body of the embryo as a part of it from the first, mingling with the material which comes from the female? Or does the semen communicate nothing to the material body of the embryo, but only to the power and movement in it? For this power is that which acts and makes, while that which is made and receives the form is the residue of the secretion in the female. Now the latter alternative appears to be the right one, both a priori and in view of the facts. For if we consider the question on general grounds, we find that whenever one thing is made from two, of which one is active and the other passive, the active agent does not exist in that which is made. And, still more generally, the same applies when one thing moves and another is moved. The moving thing does not exist in that which is moved. But the female, as female, is passive and the male as male is active, and the principle of the movement comes from him. Therefore, if we take the highest genera under which they each fall, the one being active and motive, and the other passive and moved, that one thing which is produced comes from them only in the sense in which a bed comes into being from the carpenter and the wood, or in which a ball comes into being from the wax and the form. It is plain, then, that it is not necessary that anything at all should come away from the male, and if anything does come away, it does not follow that this gives rise to the embryo as being in the embryo, but only as that which imparts the motion, and as the form. So the medical art cures the patient. This a priori argument is confirmed by the facts, for it is for this reason that some males which unite with the female do not, it appears, insert any part of themselves into the female, but on the contrary the female inserts a part of herself into the male. This occurs in some insects, for the effect produced by the semen in the female, in the case of those animals whose males do insert a part, is produced in the case of these insects by the heat, and power in the male animal itself, when the female inserts that part of herself which receives the secretion. And therefore, such animals remain united a long time, and when they are separated the young are produced quickly. For the union lasts until that which is analogous to the semen has done its work. And, when they separate, the female produces the embryo quickly, for the young is imperfect inasmuch as all such creatures give birth to scolices. What occurs in birds and oviparous fishes is the greatest proof that neither does the semen come from all parts of the male, nor does he emit anything of such a nature as to exist within that which is generated, as part of the material embryo but that he only makes a living creature by the power which resides in the semen, as we said in the case of those insects whose females insert a part of themselves into the male. For if a hen-bird is in process of producing wind eggs, and is then trodden by the cock before the egg has begun to whiten, and while it is all still yellow, then they become fertile instead of being wind eggs and if, while it is still yellow, she be trodden by another cock, the whole brood of chicks turn out like the second cock. Hence some of those who are anxious to rear fine birds act thus. They change the cocks for the first and second trading, not as if they thought that the semen is mingled with the egg or exists in it, or that it comes from all parts of the cock 
for if it did, it would have come from both cocks, so that the chick would have all its parts doubled. But it is by its force that the semen of the male gives a certain quality to the material and the nutriment in the female. For the second semen added to the first can produce this effect by heat and concoction, as the egg acquires nutriment so long as it is growing. The same conclusion is to be drawn from the generation of oviparous fishes. When the female has laid her eggs, the male sprinkles the milt over them, and those eggs are fertilized which it reaches, but not the others. This shows that the male does not contribute anything to the quantity, but only to the quality of the embryo. From what has been said, it is plain that the semen does not come from the whole of the body of the male in those animals which emit it, and that the contribution of the female to the generative product is not the same as that of the male. But the male contributes the principle of movement, and the female the material. This is why the female does not produce offspring by herself, for she needs a principle it is something to begin the movement in the embryo, and to define the form it is to assume. Yet in some animals, as birds, the nature of the female unassisted can generate to a certain extent, for they do form something, only it is incomplete. I mean, the so-called wind eggs. 22. For the same reason, the development of the embryo takes place in the female, neither the male himself nor the female emits semen into the male, but the female receives within herself the share contributed by both, because in the female is the material from which is made the resulting product. Not only must the mass of material exist there from which the embryo is formed in the first instance, but further material must constantly be added that it may increase in size. Therefore, the birth must take place in the female. For the carpenter must keep in close connection with his timber, and the potter with his clay, and generally all workmanship, and the ultimate movement imparted to matter must be connected with the material concerned, as, for instance, architecture is in the buildings it makes. From these considerations we may also gather how it is that the male contributes to generation. The male does not emit semen at all in some animals, and where he does, this is no part of the resulting embryo. Just so, no material part comes from the carpenter to the material, it is the wood in which he works. Nor does any part of the carpenter's art exist within what he makes. But the shape and the form are imparted from him, to the material by means of the motion he sets up. It is his hands that move his tools, his tools that move the material. It is his knowledge of his art and his soul, in which is the form, that move his hands or any other part of him with a motion of some definite kind, a motion varying with the varying nature of the object made. In like manner, in the male of those animals which emit semen, nature uses the semen as a tool, and as possessing motion in actuality, just as tools are used in the products of any art, for in them lies in a certain sense the motion of the art. Such, then, is the way in which these males contribute to generation. But when the male does not emit semen, but the female inserts some part of herself into the male, this is parallel to a case in which a man should carry the material to the workman. For, by reason of weakness in such males, nature is not able to do anything by any secondary means, but the movements imparted to the material are scarcely strong enough when nature herself watches over them. Thus here she resembles a modeler in clay rather than a carpenter, for she does not touch the work she is forming by means of tools, but, as it were, with her own hands. 23. In all animals which can move about, the sexes are separated, one individual being male and one female, though both are the same in species, as with man and horse. 
but in plants these powers are mingled, female not being separated from male, wherefore they generate out of themselves and do not emit semen, but produce an embryo, what is called the seed. Empedocles puts this well in the line, and thus the tall trees oviposit, first olives, dot, dot, dot. For as the egg is an embryo, a certain part of it giving rise to the animal, and the rest being nutriment, so also from a part of the seed springs the growing plant, and the rest is nutriment, for the shoot and the first root. In a certain sense the same thing happens also in those animals which have the sexes separate, for when there is need for them to generate, the sexes are no longer separated any more than in plants, their nature desiring that they shall become one. And this is plain to view, when they copulate and are united, that one animal is made out of both. It is the nature of those creatures which do not emit semen, to remain united a long time, until the male element has formed the embryo, as with those insects which copulate. The others so remain only until the male has discharged from the parts of himself introduced something which will form the embryo in a longer time, as among the sanguinea. For the former remain paired some part of a day, while the semen forms the embryo in several days, and after emitting this they cease their union. And animals seem literally to be like divided plants, as though one should separate and divide them, when they bear seed, into the male and female existing in them. In all this nature acts like an intelligent workman, for to the essence of plants belongs no other function or business than the production of seed. Since then this is brought about by the union of male and female, Nature has mixed these, and set them together in plants, so that the sexes are not divided in them. Plants, however, have been investigated elsewhere. But the function of the animal is not only to generate, which is common to all living things, but they all of them participate also in a kind of knowledge, some more and some less, and some very little indeed. For they have sense perception, and this is a kind of knowledge. If we consider the value of this, we find that it is of great importance compared with the class of lifeless objects, but of little compared with the use of the intellect. For, against the latter, the mere participation in touch and taste seems to be practically nothing. But beside absolute insensibility, it seems most excellent for it would seem a treasure to gain even this kind of knowledge, rather than to lie in a state of death and non-existence. Now it is by sense perception that an animal differs from those organisms which have only life. But since if it is a living animal it must also live, therefore when it is necessary for it to accomplish the function of that which has life, it unites and copulates, becoming like a plant, as we said before. Pestaceous animals, being intermediate between animals and plants, perform the function of neither class as belonging to both. As plants, they have no sexes, and one does not generate in another. As animals, they do not bear fruit from themselves, like plants but they are formed and generated from a liquid and earthy concretion. However, we must speak later of the generation of these animals. End of chapter 23 and end of book 1 Chapter 1 of book 2 of Generation of Animals by Aristotle Translated by Arthur Platt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1. That the male and female are the principles of generation has been previously stated, as also what is their power and their essence. 
But why is it that one thing becomes and is male, another female? It is the business of our discussion, as it proceeds, to try and point out, one, that the sexes arise from necessity, and the first efficient cause, two, from what sort of material they are formed, that, three, they exist because it is better, and on account of the final cause, takes us back to a principle still further remote. Now, one, some existing things are eternal and divine, whilst others admit of both existence and non-existence. But, two, that which is noble and divine is always, in virtue of its own nature, the cause of the better in such things as admit of being better or worse. And what is not eternal does admit of existence and non-existence, and can partake in the better and the worse. And, three, soul is better than body, and the living, having soul, is thereby better than the lifeless which has none, and being is better than not being, living than not living. These, then, are the reasons of the generation of animals. For, since it is impossible that such a class of things as animals should be of an eternal nature, therefore that which comes into being is eternal in the only way possible. Now, it is impossible for it to be eternal as an individual, though of course the real essence of things is in the individual. Were it such, it would be eternal, but it is possible for it as a species. This is why there is always a class of men and animals and plants. But since the male and female essences are the first principles of these, they will exist in the existing individuals for the sake of generation. Again, as the first efficient or moving cause to which belong the definition and the form is better and more divine in its nature than the material on which it works, it is better that the superior principle should be separated from the inferior. Therefore, wherever it is possible, and so far as it is possible, the male is separated from the female. For the first principle of the movement or efficient cause, whereby that which comes into being is male, is better and more divine than the material whereby it is female. The male, however, comes together and mingles with the female for the work of generation, because this is common to both. A thing lives, then, in virtue of participating in the male and female principles, wherefore, even plants have some kind of life, but the class of animals exists in virtue of sense perception. The sexes are divided in nearly all of these that can move about, for the reasons already stated, and some of them, as said before, emit semen in copulation, others not. The reason of this is that the higher animals are more independent in their nature, so that they have greater size, and this cannot exist without vital heat. For the greater body requires more force to move it, and heat is a motive force. Therefore, taking a general view, we may say that sanguinea are of greater size than bloodless animals, and those which move about than those which remain fixed. And these are just the animals which emit semen on account of their heat and size. So much for the cause of the existence of the two sexes. Some animals bring to perfection and produce into the world a creature like themselves, as all those which bring their young into the world alive. Others produce something undeveloped which has not yet acquired its own form. In this latter division the sanguinea lay eggs. The bloodless animals either lay an egg or give birth to a scolex. The difference between egg and scolex is this. An egg is that from a part of which the young comes into being, the rest being nutriment for it. But the whole of a scolex is developed into the whole of the young animal. Of the vivipara, which bring into the world an animal like themselves, some are internally viviparous, as men, 
horses, cattle, and of marine animals, dolphins, and the other cetacea. Others first lay eggs within themselves, and only after this are externally viviparous, as the cartilaginous fishes. Among the ovipara, some produce the egg in a perfect condition, as birds and all oviparous quadrupeds and footless animals, exemplagratia, lizards and tortoises, and most snakes. For the eggs of all these do not increase when once laid. The eggs of others are imperfect. Such are those of fishes, crustaceans, and cephalopods, for their eggs increase after being produced. All the vivipara are sanguineous, and the sanguinea are either viviparous or oviparous, except those which are altogether infertile. Among bloodless animals the insects produce a scolex, like those that are generated by copulation, and those that copulate themselves, though not so generated. For there are some insects of this sort, which, though they come into being by spontaneous generation, are yet male and female. From their union something is produced, only it is imperfect. The reason of this has been previously stated. These classes admit of much cross-division. Not all bipeds are viviparous, for birds are oviparous. Nor are they all oviparous, for man is viviparous. Nor are all quadrupeds oviparous, for horses, cattle, and countless others are viviparous. Nor are they all viviparous, for lizards, crocodiles, and many others lay eggs. Nor does the presence or absence of feet make the difference between them. For not only are some footless animals viviparous, as vipers and the cartilaginous fishes, while others are oviparous, as the other fishes and serpents, but also among those which have feet many are oviparous and many viviparous, as the quadrupeds above mentioned, and some which have feet as man, and some which have not, as the whale and dolphin, are internally viviparous. By this character, then, it is not possible to divide them, nor is any of the locomotive organs the cause of this difference. But it is those animals which are more perfect in their nature and participate in a purer element, which are viviparous, for nothing is internally viviparous unless it receive and breathe out air. But the more perfect are those which are hotter in their nature and have more moisture and are not earthy in their composition. And the measure of natural heat is the lung, when it has blood in it. For generally those animals which have a lung are hotter than those which have not. And in the former class again, those whose lung is not spongy, nor solid, nor containing only a little blood, but soft and full of blood. And as the animal is perfect, but the egg and the scolex are imperfect, so the perfect is naturally produced from the more perfect. If animals are hotter, as shown by their possessing a lung, but drier in their nature, or are colder, but have more moisture, then they either lay a perfect egg, or are viviparous after laying an egg within themselves. For birds and scaly reptiles, because of their heat, produce a perfect egg. But because of their dryness, it is only an egg. The cartilaginous fishes have less heat than these, but more moisture, so that they are intermediate, for they are both oviparous and viviparous within themselves, the former because they are cold, the latter because of their moisture, for moisture is vivifying, whereas dryness is furthest removed from what has life. Since they have neither feathers nor scales, such as either reptiles or other fishes have, all which are signs rather of a dry and earthy nature, the egg they produce is soft, for the earthy matter does not come to the surface in their eggs any more than in themselves. This is why they lay eggs in themselves, for if the egg were laid externally it would be destroyed, having no protection. Animals that are cold and rather dry than moist also lay eggs, but the egg is imperfect. At the same time, because they are of an earthy nature, and the egg they produce is imperfect, 
Therefore, it has a hard integument that it may be preserved by the protection of the shell-like covering. Hence, fishes, because they are scaly and crustacea, because they are of an earthy nature, lay eggs with a hard integument. The cephalopods, having themselves bodies of a sticky nature, preserve in the same way the imperfect eggs they lay, for they deposit a quantity of sticky material about the embryo. All insects produce a scolex. Now, all the insects are bloodless, wherefore all creatures that produce a scolex from themselves are so. But we cannot say simply that all bloodless animals produce a scolex, for the classes overlap one another. 1. The insects. 2. The animals that produce a scolex. 3. Those that lay their egg imperfect, as the scaly fishes, the crustacea, and the cephalopoda. I say that these form a gradation, for the eggs of these latter resemble a scolex, in that they increase after oviposition, and the scolex of insects again as it develops resembles an egg. How so, we shall explain later. We must observe how rightly nature orders generation in regular gradation. The more perfect and hotter animals produce their young perfect in respect of quality. In respect of quantity, this is so with no animal, for the young always increase in size after birth, and these generate living animals within themselves from the first. The second class do not generate perfect animals within themselves from the first, for they are only viviparous after first laying eggs, but still they are externally viviparous. The third class do not produce a perfect animal, but an egg, and this egg is perfect. Those whose nature is still colder than these produce an egg, but an imperfect one, which is perfected outside the body, as the class of scaly fishes, the crustacea, and the cephalopods. The fifth and coldest class does not even lay an egg from itself but so far as the young ever attain to this condition at all, it is outside the body of the parent, as has been said already. For insects produce a scolex first. The scolex, after developing, becomes egg-like, for the so-called chrysalis or pupa is equivalent to an egg. Then from this it is that a perfect animal comes into being, reaching the end of its development in the second change. Some animals, then, as said before, do not come into being from semen, but all the sanguinea do so, which are generated by copulation, the male emitting semen into the female. When this has entered into her, the young are formed and assume their peculiar character, some within the animals themselves when they are viviparous, others in eggs. There is a considerable difficulty in understanding how the plant is formed out of the seed or any animal out of the semen. Everything that comes into being or is made must, one, be made out of something, two, be made by the agency of something, and three, must become something. Now, that out of which it is made is the material. This some animals have in its first form within themselves, taking it from the female parent as all those which are not born alive but produced as a scolex or an egg. Others receive it from the mother for a long time by sucking, as the young of all those which are not only externally but also internally viviparous. Such then is the material out of which things come into being. But we now are inquiring not out of what the parts of an animal are made, but by what agency. Either it is something external which makes them, or else something existing in the seminal fluid and the semen, and this must either be soul, or a part of soul, or something containing soul. Now it would appear irrational to suppose that any of either the internal organs or the other parts is made by something external, since one thing cannot set up a motion in another without touching it nor can a thing be affected in any way by another if it does not set up a motion in it. Something then of the sort we require exists in the embryo itself, being either a part of it or separate from it. 
to suppose that it should be something else separate from it is irrational. For after the animal has been produced, does this something perish, or does it remain in it? But nothing of the kind appears to be in it, nothing which is not a part of the whole plant or animal. Yet, on the other hand, it is absurd to say that it perishes after making either all the parts or only some of them. If it makes some of the parts and then perishes, what is to make the rest of them? Suppose this something makes the heart, and then perishes, and the heart makes another organ. By the same argument, either all the parts must perish, or all must remain. Therefore, it is preserved, and does not perish. Therefore, it is a part of the embryo itself which exists in the semen from the beginning. And if indeed there is no part of the soul which does not exist in some part of the body, it would also be a part containing soul in it from the beginning. How, then, does it make the other parts? Either all the parts, as heart, lung, liver, eye, and all the rest, come into being together, or in succession, as is said in the verse ascribed to Orpheus, for there he says that an animal comes into being in the same way as the knitting of a net. That the former is not the fact is plain, even to the senses, for some of the parts are clearly visible as already existing in the embryo, while others are not. That it is not because of their being too small that they are not visible is clear, for the lung is of greater size than the heart, and yet appears later than the heart in the original development. Since, then, one is earlier and another later, does the one make the other, and does the latter part exist on account of the part which is next to it? Or rather, does the one come into being only after the other? I mean, for instance, that it is not the fact that the heart, having come into being first, then makes the liver, and the liver again another organ, but that the liver only comes into being after the heart, and not by the agency of the heart, as a man becomes a man after being a boy, not by his agency. An explanation of this is that in all the productions of nature, or of art, what already exists potentially is brought into being only by what exists actually. Therefore, if one organ formed another, the form and the character of the latter organ would have to exist in the earlier exempli gratia, the form of the liver in the heart, and otherwise also, the theory is strange and fictitious. Yet again, if the whole animal or plant is formed from semen or seed, it is impossible that any part of it should exist ready-made in the semen or seed, whether that part be able to make the other parts or no. For it is plain that if it exists in it from the first, it was made by that which made the semen. But semen must be made first, and that is the function of the generating parent. So then, it is not possible that any part should exist in it, and therefore it has not within itself that which makes the parts. But neither can this agent be external, and yet it must needs be one or other of the two. We must try, then, to solve this difficulty, for perhaps some one of the statements made cannot be made without qualification, exempli gratia, the statement that the parts cannot be made by what is external to the semen. For if in a certain sense they cannot, yet in another sense they can. Now it makes no difference whether we say the semen or that from which the semen comes in so far as the semen has in itself the movement initiated by the other. It is possible then that A should move B, and B move C, that in fact the case should be the same as with the automatic machines shown as curiosities. For the parts of such machines, while at rest, have a sort of potentiality of motion in them, and when any external force puts the first of them in motion, immediately the next is moved in actuality. As then, in these automatic machines, the external force moves the parts in a certain sense, not by touching any part at the moment, 
but by having touched one previously. In like manner also, that from which the semen comes, or in other words, that which made the semen, sets up the movement in the embryo, and makes the parts of it, by having first touched something, though not continuing to touch it. In a way, it is the innate motion that does this, as the act of building builds the house. Plainly, then, while there is something which makes the parts, this does not exist as a definite object, nor does it exist in the semen, at the first, as a complete part. But how is each part formed? We must answer this by starting in the first instance from the principle that, in all products of nature or art, a thing is made by something actually existing out of that which is potentially, such as the finished product. Now the semen is of such a nature, and has in it such a principle of motion, that, when the motion is ceasing, each of the parts comes into being, and that, as a part having life or soul. For there is no such thing as face or flesh without life or soul in it. It is only equivocally that they will be called face or flesh if the life has gone out of them, just as if they had been made of stone or wood. And the homogeneous parts and the organic come into being together. And just as we should not say that an axe or other instrument or organ was made by the fire alone, so neither shall we say that foot or hand were made by heat alone. The same applies also to flesh, for this too has a function. While, then, we may allow that hardness and softness, stickiness and brittleness, and whatever other qualities are found in the parts that have life and soul, may be caused by mere heat and cold. Yet, when we come to the principle in virtue of which flesh is flesh and bone is bone, that is no longer so. What makes them is the movement set up by the male parent, who is in actuality what that out of which the offspring is made is in potentiality. This is what we find in the products of art. Heat and cold may make the iron soft and hard, but what makes a sword is the movement of the tools employed, this movement containing the principle of the art. For the art is the starting point and form of the product, only it exists in something else, whereas the movement of nature exists in the product itself, issuing from another nature, which has the form in actuality. Has the semen soul or not? The same argument applies here as in the question concerning the parts. As no part, if it participate not in soul, will be a part, except in an equivocal sense, as the eye of a dead man is still called an eye. So no soul will exist in anything except that of which it is soul. It is plain, therefore, that semen both has soul and is soul potentially. But a thing existing potentially may be nearer or further from its realization in actuality, as exempli gratia, a mathematician, when asleep, is further from his realization in actuality as engaged in mathematics than when he is awake, and when awake again but not studying mathematics, he is further removed than when he is so studying. Accordingly, it is not any part that is the cause of the soul's coming into being, but it is the first moving cause from outside. For nothing generates itself, though when it has come into being it thenceforward increases itself. Hence it is that only one part comes into being first, and not all of them together. But that must first come into being which has a principle of increase. For this nutritive power exists in all alike, whether animals or plants, and this is the same as the power that enables an animal or plant to generate another like itself. 
that being the function of them all, if naturally perfect. And this is necessary for the reason that whenever a living thing is produced it must grow. It is produced then by something else of the same name, as exempli gratia man is produced by man, but it is increased by means of itself. There is then something which increases it. If this is a single part, this must come into being first. Therefore, if the heart is first made in some animals, and what is analogous to the heart in the others which have no heart, it is from this, or its analogue, that the first principle of movement would arise. We have thus discussed the difficulties previously raised on the question, what is the efficient cause of generation, in each case, as the first moving and formative power. End of chapter 1 Chapters 2 and 3 of Book 2 of Generation of Animals by Aristotle Translated by Arthur Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 2. The next question to be mooted concerns the nature of semen. For whereas when it issues from the animal it is thick and white, yet on cooling it becomes liquid as water, and its color is that of water. This would appear strange, for water is not thickened by heat yet semen is thick when it issues from within the animal's body, which is hot, and becomes liquid on cooling. Again, watery fluids freeze, but semen, if exposed in frosts to the open air, does not freeze, but liquefies, as if it was thickened by the opposite of cold. Yet it is unreasonable again to suppose that it is thickened by heat, for it is only substances having a predominance of earth in their composition that coagulate and thicken on boiling, exempli gratia, milk. It ought then to solidify on cooling, but as a matter of fact it does not become solid in any part, but the whole of it goes like water. This then is the difficulty. If it is water, Water, evidently, does not thicken through heat, whereas the semen is thick, and both it and the body, whence it issues, are hot. If it is made of earth, or a mixture of earth and water, it ought not to liquefy entirely and turn to water. Perhaps, however, we have not discriminated all the possibilities. It is not only the liquids composed of water and earthy matter that thicken, but also those composed of water and air. Foam, for instance, becomes thicker and white, and the smaller and less visible the bubbles in it, the whiter and firmer does the mass appear. The same thing happens also with oil. On mixing with air it thickens, wherefore that which is whitening becomes thicker, the watery part in it being separated off by the heat and turning to air and if oxide of lead is mixed with water or even with oil, the mass increases greatly and changes from liquid and dark to firm and white, the reason being that air is mixed in with it, which increases the mass and makes the white shine through, as in foam and snow, for snow is foam and water itself, on mingling with oil, becomes thick and white, because air is entangled in it by the act of pounding them together. And oil itself has much air in it, for shininess is a property of air, not of earth or water. This, too, is why it floats on the surface of the water, for the air contained in it as in a vessel bears it up and makes it float being the cause of its lightness. So too oil is thickened without freezing in cold weather and frosts. It does not freeze because of its heat, for the air is hot and will not freeze, but because the air is forced together and compressed, as 
dot 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 by the cold the oil becomes thicker these are the reasons why semen is firm and white when it issues from within the animal it has a quantity of hot air in it because of the internal heat afterwards when the heat has evaporated and the air has cooled it turns liquid and dark for the water and any small quantity of earthy matter there may be remain in semen as it dries as they do in phlegm semen then is a compound of spirit pneuma and water and the former is hot air air hence semen is liquid in its nature because it is made of water what tejas the canadian has asserted of the semen of elephants is manifestly untrue he says that it hardens so much in drying that it becomes like amber but this does not happen though it is true that one semen must be more earthy than another and especially so with animals that have much earthy matter in them because of the bulk of their bodies and it is thick and white because it is mixed with spirit for it is also an invariable rule that it is white and herodotus does not report the truth when he says that the semen of the ethiopians is black as if everything must needs be black in those who have a black skin and that too when he saw their teeth were white the reason of the whiteness of semen is that it is a foam and foam is white especially that which is composed of the smallest parts small in the sense that each bubble is invisible which is what happens when water and oil are mixed and shaken together as said before even the ancients seem to have noticed that semen is of the nature of foam at least it was from this they named the goddess who presides over union this then is the explanation of the problem proposed and it is plain too that this is why semen does not freeze for air will not freeze three the next question to raise and to answer is this if in the case of those animals which emit semen into the female that which enters makes no part of the resulting embryo where is the material part of it diverted if as we have seen it acts by means of the power residing in it it is not only necessary to decide whether what is forming in the female receives anything material or not from that which has entered her but also concerning the soul in virtue of which an animal is so called and this is in virtue of the sensitive part of the soul does this exist originally in the semen and in the unfertilized embryo or not and if it does whence does it come for nobody would put down the unfertilized embryo as soulless or in every sense bereft of life since both the semen and the embryo of an animal have every bit as much life as a plant and it is productive up to a certain point that then they possess the nutritive soul is plain and plain is it from the discussions elsewhere about soul why this soul must be acquired first as they develop they also acquire the sensitive soul in virtue of which an animal is an animal for exempli gratia an animal does not become at the same time an animal and a man or a horse or any other particular animal for the end is developed last and the peculiar character of the species is the end of the generation in each individual hence arises a question of the greatest difficulty which we must strive to solve to the best of our ability and as far as possible when and how and whence is a share in reason acquired by those animals that participate in this principle it is plain that the semen and the unfertilized embryo while still separate from each other must be assumed to have the nutritive soul potentially but not actually except that like those unfertilized embryos that are separated from the mother 
it absorbs nourishment and performs the function of the nutritive soul. For at first all such embryos seem to live the life of a plant, and it is clear that we must be guided by this in speaking of the sensitive and the rational soul. For all three kinds of soul, not only the nutritive, must be possessed potentially before they are possessed in actuality. And it is necessary either, one, that they should all come into being in the embryo without existing previously outside it, or two, that they should all exist previously, or three, that some should so exist and others not. Again, it is necessary that they should either, one, come into being in the material supplied by the female, without entering with the semen of the male, or, two, come from the male and be imparted to the material in the female. If the latter, then either all of them, or none, or some, must come into being in the male from outside. Now, that it is impossible for them all to pre-exist is clear from this consideration. Plainly, those principles whose activity is bodily cannot exist without a body. Exempli gratia, walking cannot exist without feet. For the same reason also, they cannot enter from outside. For neither is it possible for them to enter by themselves, being inseparable from a body, nor yet in a body, for the semen is only a secretion of the nutriment in process of change. It remains then for the reason alone so to enter and alone to be divine, for no bodily activity has any connection with the activity of reason. Now, it is true that the faculty of all kinds of soul seems to have a connection with a matter different from and more divine than the so-called elements. But as one soul differs from another in honor and dishonor, so differs also the nature of the corresponding matter. All have in their semen that which causes it to be productive, I mean what is called vital heat. This is not fire, nor any such force, but it is the spiritus, included in the semen and the foam-like, and the natural principle in the spiritus, being analogous to the element of the stars. Hence, whereas fire generates no animal, and we do not find any living thing forming in either solids or liquids under the influence of fire, the heat of the sun and that of animals does generate them. Not only is this true of the heat that works through the semen, but whatever other residuum of the animal nature there may be, this also has still a vital principle in it. From such considerations it is clear that the heat in animals neither is fire nor derives its origin from fire. Let us return to the material of the semen, in and with which comes away from the male the spiritus, conveying the principle of soul. Of this principle there are two kinds. The one is not connected with matter, and belongs to those animals in which is included something divine, to wit what is called the reason, while the other is inseparable from matter. This material of the semen dissolves and evaporates because it has a liquid and watery nature. Therefore we ought not to expect it always to come out again from the female, or to form any part of the embryo that has taken shape from it. The case resembles that of the fig juice, which curdles milk, for this too changes without becoming any part of the curdling masses. It has been settled then in what sense the embryo and the semen have soul, and in what sense they have not. They have it potentially, but not actually. Now semen is a secretion and is moved with the same movement as that in virtue of which the body increases, this increase being due to subdivision of the nutriment in its last stage. When it has entered the uterus, it puts into form the corresponding secretion of the female, and moves it with the same movement wherewith it is moved itself. For the female's contribution also is a secretion, and has all the parts in it potentially, though none of them actually. It has in it potentially even those parts which differentiate the female from the male. 
for just as the young of mutilated parents are sometimes born mutilated and sometimes not, so also the young born of a female are sometimes female and sometimes male instead. For the female is, as it were, a mutilated male, and the catamenia are semen, only not pure, for there is only one thing they have not in them, the principle of soul. For this reason, whenever a wind egg is produced by any animal, the egg so forming has in it the parts of both sexes potentially, but has not the principle in question, so that it does not develop into a living creature, for this is introduced by the semen of the male. When such a principle has been imparted to the secretion of the female, it becomes an embryo. Liquid, but corporeal substances become surrounded by some kind of covering on heating, like the solid scum which forms on boiled foods when cooling. All bodies are held together by the glutinous. This quality, as the embryo develops and increases in size, is acquired by the sinewy substance, which holds together the parts of animals, being actual sinew in some and its analogue in others. To the same class belong also skin, blood vessels, membranes and the like, for these differ in being more or less glutinous, and generally in excess and deficiency. End of chapter 3